I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles. Welcome to Stand Up and Holler. On tonight's episode, we'll discuss Daryl Jackson committing to Miami. The Gator Guard is has been announced, uh, draftable Gators, and we will finish up with some guys that could have an impact in the NFL but might not go drafted. We'll discuss their prospects too. Will, we're recording this the night before the NFL draft. You a draft guy? I mean, a little bit. It more so used to be. Now, now I, you know, NBA playoffs are going on. My kids have baseball. So I will look at it at the end. I can remember in college sitting there like on a, they used to have it on Saturdays, right? Mm. So you'd be sitting, you'd be sitting there all day sort of, you know, doing something else. But every 15 minutes, Chris Berman would pop up and there'd be a pick. Uh, but now Berman's old and, you know, they do it on a Thursday night and split it into Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So, I mean, you know, look, it's exciting to see where all these guys go. Um, at the same time, you know, Thursday night's a, a tough one for for me. Saturday worked better when I was younger. Yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm at a point with my uh, fandom with the Jags where I'm just uh, I'm looking forward <laughs> to uh, who's going to disappoint me for the next several years. That's I'm looking forward to that pick. But I, I'm at the point, the NFL draft right now, there's no standout surefire number one pick a lot of guys that could be picked in there that deserve to be picked highly right go go after someone that can give trevor lawrence the support he needs asap that's it that's my only comment i'll make on the jags we'll we'll move uh, on so we'll- so i i have a buddy who's uh who's an eagles fan and i was asking him who he wants and he goes i don't care we have two first round picks i just want them to draft people from the sec <laughs> like, and this is not a guy who went to the uh, to an FCC school. He went to Syracuse. He's from the Northeast. Huge Eagles fan. Born in born in this general area. All he all he knows is I want them to draft people from the SEC. So I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, they they like that hurts the Smith connection up there. I guess a little Bama action up there in Philly. All right, let's jump back into college football here. We'll start with two bits tonight. Maryland sophomore defensive lineman Daryl Jackson. He's six foot six, three hundred pounds. I, I saw a picture of him sitting next to Gervon Dexter. Will that that would have looked like a formidable option up the middle. Uh, ends up transferring after just a year at Maryland, originally from Gadsden, Florida, which is on a panhandle. But he played in 13 contests last year as a uh, reserve, 22 tackles on the season. And on April 7th, entered into the NCAA transfer portal. Florida had a couple of visits, went down to Miami, Sounds like Miami, before they, he could get back to Florida this weekend, really did what they had to do to close the deal. He ends up committing to the Canes a couple of days ago here. Um, you know, three-star guy coming out of high school on 24-7 sports. Well, it would have been nice to have. It's definitely an area of need. Uh, this is not a make-or-break commitment here in my mind. No, I mean, so I, I think there's a few things here. One is that um, Florida wanted him. Right. This yes. was somebody that Napier wanted. This was someone that Florida thought they had, or at least thought they had a good opportunity with Blake Alderman over at 24 seven was suggesting that essentially there was an NIL deal where the money was kind of equivalent between Miami and Florida, Florida pre- felt pretty comfortable. And then Miami upped the deal. And all of a sudden uh, he, he's with the hurricanes and you wonder, you know, the, Alderman didn't have any information about whether Florida had an opportunity to match. It might've been, Hey, you're either taking this or you're not getting it. And that might've been the way that that was sort of presented. And so, you know, Hey, um, you gotta do what you gotta do for your family and for, for your finances and all that sort of stuff. I get it. Um, at the same time, I think it does sort of bubble to the front that uh, things have changed a little bit in the NIL world and, and you know, that Florida's going to have to catch up. So this is somebody they wanted. It's somebody where they need, where they need depth. Obviously the team was ranked 85th in yards per rush allowed last season against FBS opponents. Couldn't stop a counter against even bad teams, let alone when they were facing good teams. So yeah, I mean, look, it hurts to lose a guy at that position at the same time, there are going to be other people who pop up at defensive tackle in the next couple of weeks. There are also going to be, um, there, there are also, I don't think 2022 is really, it's not a make or break year for Napier. And so transfer portal guys are here for depth. They're here to get guys who, who buy into the culture. A guy who's going to be around for three years is nice at the same time. If all you're really, you know, we need to plug holes until we get to a place where we've got high school recruits ready to step in and um, you know, Jackson would have helped that but like you said I mean he was he was what like the 717th player nationally coming out yeah. of, coming out of high school three-star guy um had 22 tackles last season no tackles for loss in Maryland 
So you're talking, you know, when we look at like guys like Antonio Valentino, Daquan Newkirk, Tyrone Truesdell, like you're probably looking at about the same kind of impact. So we'll see what he does down in Miami. Maybe he turns into a star, but based on, based on just the general statistics and his profile, I think you're looking at more a depth piece than you are somebody who's going to come in and be a huge, huge contributor. Now <laughs> the most tackles by anyone not named Gervin, Gervon Dexter at, uh, at defensive tackle for Florida is Desmond Watson, who had seven tackles last year. Mm -hmm. so, so from the standpoint of just like a guy with 22 tackles, wow, that's a lot of experience. He played his old freshman year. Um, so yeah, they need to, they need to make some additions there, but no, I agree with you. And you, and you don't, again, you don't grade the transfer portal. You don't grade recruiting on one recruit. I think you look at it and you say, okay, missed on this one. Can't miss on the next one. And, you know, maybe some changes need to be made in terms of how you prioritize. But the other thing is, you know, I've been going back and forth a little bit today about how much these players should be worth. And based on some of the numbers that are flying around in the rumors, you know, the amount that Miami is rumored to have, or the, that the Miami boosters are rumored to have set up with an NIL um, is significant for a guy with that general profile. And, you know, this is, it's going to be a resource allocation business at this point. When you think about college football, you, you know, it's like buying stocks, right? If all you buy is Apple now, it's really expensive because you can only buy one or two shares of Apple, whereas you can buy a, you can buy a, uh, you know, a small cap stock or a small comp or buy into a small business and potentially make a lot more money off of that at the same time a lot of those businesses go out of business, right? And, and so there's more risk. And I think that's what people are going to have to gauge is they decide who they're going to invest in when it comes to these different players. You know, are they going to trust their eyes, their evaluations and that sort of stuff? Or are they going to stick with, you know, going after the sure things who are more expensive, but are going to give you a more consistent rate of return? The, the appeal of a six foot six, 300 pound guy is obviously apparent a defensive tackle when you need a player like that right uh so i'm not trying to downplay uh the loss to miami in this but i think one i think this makes a statement that you're going to see a lot of future again this is a florida guy gaston county for those who aren't, who aren't familiar up uh, near the panhandle closer to tallahassee than either one of florida for uh, florida or miami by the way but I, I think what's interesting with this particular thing, I think people are a little bit weary right now just because there's not a lot of recruits on the board, right? We got Patterson last week at receiver. Uh, he's three-star. You haven't seen those five-star kids quite jump in the fold yet. We've talked about it's a smart move for them to hold out as long as possible. I, 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 think, I, I think that's what we're going to see. I don't think you're going to get a ton of early commitments from these guys. Um, but, Will, what do you say to people – who are panicking a little bit here. Here's another head-to-head. -head. We, we have a head-to-head -head loss to Miami here on the recruiting trail for a guy that we were definitely in on. I mean, I guess what I say is that it's okay to be it, – It's it's you're not crazy if you say Napier hasn't proven it to me yet, right? The, the, and I think, you know, that was one of the lessons coming out of National Signing Day. You know, Harold Perkins and Jacoby Matthews decided to go to other places, and there were some grumblings about Matthews before National Signing Day. But we thought we were in on a few of those guys, thought we were going to get a couple of those guys. And then it turns out that, you know, Boardingham commits and, and Douglas commits, but we didn't get a five-star guy coming in or a very high four-star coming in on National Signing Day. And the, the takeaway for me, at least from that, is the jury's still out on Napier. Right. That he came in. He said, we're not going to rush it. We're going to we're going to bring in people who fit our program and all that sort of stuff. And he stuck to that his first year. But we all know that the second year recruiting class is huge. We know that it's a huge portion of how he's going to build the program. We know he's come in. He's built this army. We know that the army has has made a lot of noise in terms of bringing in a lot of different people in terms of all the publicity that Katie Turner and Bree Wade have gotten and, you know, all that sort of stuff. But at some point it has to turn into results. And I think the idea that people are sitting here waiting for the results and some people are more patient than others. I think that's a valid thing to look at it and say, Hey, the jury's still out. And I want Napier to prove it to me. I, I think that there are definite, there are definite PR advantages to getting people to commit. At the same time, I will say that all of Florida's targets are committing in the next couple of, or many of Florida's targets are committing in the next couple of months. 
So, you know, Kermani McLean and, and um, you know, some of these other guys, all the corners <laughs> are, are pretty much going to be committing either May or June. And, and when you, when you see where those folks go, then I think that'll give you a, a sign as to whether you should be panicked or whether you should still be patient. And, you know, look, if, if there were three five-star guys in the fold already, no one would care about the three-star defensive tackle who goes someplace else. Right. Because it's a perception thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the three star goes to Miami and the my and everybody's Miami friend, friends are ragging on them. You got the only people who can't say anything is Florida State because this guy's right around the corner from Florida State. But you know, look, I mean, there's there's some real consternation within the fan base because we haven't had an elite recruiter around for a while. And the the supposition was we didn't have the funds, we didn't have the infrastructure, we didn't have the facilities, and we didn't have the right coach. And all of those things, you know, have a check mark next to them, except for the coach, and there's still a question mark there. And so, look, I, I think you have to. Napier's not going anywhere, so you're not going to affect anything by just being constantly negative about stuff. At the same time, I think you can be realistic, and the reality is, is right now it's too early to say yes, he's great, or no, he's not. This is one data point. And I think you look at the entire set of data points, and that's one of the reasons why we look at classes in February, and it's why we look at classes that consist of 25, 26, 27 guys to be able to look at it compared to everybody else. We know what he has to do, this bump class. The timing with which he does it is less important to me so long as we start to see some momentum build. Now, if none of these folks commit in June, July, August, then we got problems. But even Urban Meyer, he only had four commits going into the season. Back in back in 2006, you know, Percy Harvin, Tim Tebow, Brandon Spikes, those guys all committed in either December or January. And so, you know, look, there's a track record for a big class being put together towards the end at Florida. And so as long as these guys aren't committed elsewhere, I think you can continue to hold out hope. But, yeah, I think Napier's got something to prove. You see the investment Florida's making right now. You see the investment Miami's making at the moment. These two schools see themselves as elite in football, whether or not the results have been there of late, Will. They're trying to get on the level with the Alabamas and Georgias of the world off the field as well with the recruiting. Something like this where you lose out, I, I again, it's one recruit, three-star guy. But does the losing out to the Miami aspect of it carry extra weight here that people are kind of looking at two programs that are trying to reset their footing in the recruiting world and, and be on the up and up? Hey, we lost out to those guys. You know, it's one thing if we lose out to Alabama or Georgia who are, are ahead of us at the moment, but we're losing out to the, the, the guys that are supposed to be neck and neck with us. Is that is I mean, that a little extra weight on this right now? Do you think that's I mean the fact the fact that Crystal Ball's in the exact same situation as Napier, mm-hmm. I do think does rub a little bit of salt in the wound, right? I mean, you sit there and you look at it, you go, why isn't our guy bringing this guy in? At the same time, I mean, again, we have to couch this with if Napier had a guy commit in the 720s. Everybody be like, oh, three star Napier, <laughs> right? like like that. The same people who are upset that he missed out on this three star would That's be the people true. who are complaining about, <laughs> or the same people who are complaining about Patterson, right? So so there's a little bit of a. No matter what happens, unless Cormani McClay and that whole list of five stars ends up committing, there are going to be people who are disappointed, which is why, again, we talked about this with basketball a couple of weeks ago. My whole thing is we need to set expectations. And then when the reality doesn't meet the expectation, that's when we get upset and have a conversation. So my expectation is, is that there's going to be at least one five star by the time the season kicks off and that there are going to be three five stars in this class by the time the class is at the end. Those are my those are my expectations. And if the reality doesn't match those expectations, then I will say, OK, it's time to have a discussion about why we weren't able to meet those expectations at the same time. Because those expectations are set, I can't get upset when one guy commits or one guy decommits because I've got specific metrics that I'm looking at along the way. And I, I think I think that's true for all of these things, right? There are going to be a lot of people who get upset if Florida goes seven and six this year. I won't. I actually think that might be a good thing because if you look back at the last guy, at the last two guys, they had great first years. And I do wonder, especially with Mullen, the stuff at the end where sort of the culture seemed to be kind of rotten, you know. Is that because there was early success and people didn't have to buy into the discipline that's necessary and the hard work that's necessary in order to be elite because they were going 10 and three and 11 and two and had a guy like Kyle Trask to bail them out. 
is that one of the reasons why things sort of went downhill at the end for both the McElwain and the Molinera? I think there are other reasons, but there's no reason Florida should have been seven and six last year or six and seven, whatever we were last year. There's no reason Florida was more talented than many of the teams they played. Recruiting was not the reason that they were losing those games. It was a lack of discipline and a lack of execution. So I go back to what are my expectations for the 2022 season? And I and we're going to set that before the season starts and say, these are the expectations. This is what we want to see. And it will. And if I go 12 and 0, I'm one, I'm being unreasonable, but at least I'm setting an expectation that if he goes 10 and two, I can say he didn't do a good job. You can argue with me about whether, whether that's reasonable or not. It's not, but at least I've set an expectation. So that's the only thing I'd ask. I'd ask for fans. Look, you can complain about this transfer going someplace else. I get it. I understand the reticence. I understand the, I want to see improve it. And it's been a decade since we've had a good recruiter and, and all that sort of stuff. I get it at the same time, set my expect, set your expectations. Like what are your expectations from the transfer portal? Is your expectation that Napier is going to get every single guy that he goes after in the transfer portal? Cause if that's your expectation, it's unreasonable. If your expectation is, and, and the other thing is, is we haven't even touched on this at all, but Resource allocation is important. You spend money on one person or if the NIL, if the collectives spend money and commit money to one commit, that means they don't have money to commit to somebody else, um, especially the way these collectives are being run at Florida, where they're actually funding it before, you know, before they write these deals. And so, you know, look, you got to figure out who do you want to allocate money to and where do you say no? Same thing if you're buying a car, right? You walk in to buy a car and you've got a certain dollar amount you're going to pay for that car and you make a decision. And if the, if the owner of the dealership won't give you the deal, you walk out, right? Because the amount of money you have to give up in order to get that vehicle isn't worth it. And I, and look, I, the money is in here. So I guess we have to treat these guys like commodities, but that's the reality is that, the NIL now is just sort of bringing to light, percolating to the surface, all of the transactions that were going on behind the scenes. But the other thing is, is that it brought out folks who might not have contributed when it was under the table stuff. And now they're happy to contribute because it helps the program. And so the money is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and how that's allocated. It's going to be fascinating, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a resource allocation problem that I, to be honest, especially in the portal early on, I think I'd rather a coach be conservative than overspend, 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 and kind of set the market and then not have anything left when a truly elite guy comes free. Well, and that's something we talked about today and our back and forth we had on text there. I think it's a different situation too when, hey, if you see school one, beat out school two for three guys in a row. Maybe that fourth guy is going to get a little extra from school one to make sure they're not getting beat out. So, and as the time goes toward signing day, as we get closer to signing day, you might see some better offers, which is why I stand by the fact that I think holding out as long as possible is going to be beneficial to these some of these guys. Yeah, we'll see, man. There's a bunch of these yep. five stars who are recruiting pretty soon. Um, there, there's no reason why the collectives can't have the NIL deals drawn up for these guys in June and July, just like they will in December, you know, say, Hey, put your best offer on the table and I'll take it in August or September. Um, you know, and, and the reality is in some ways, this will probably prevent flips because once you get that NIL deal, you get all the best NIL deals on the table. You know, you can't, you can't, that's a good point too. Yeah. You know, th there's, there's value in having a contract on the table that somebody says, yes, I'm going to take this. It makes it a whole lot harder than just a verbal commitment where all you got to do is send a text that says, respect my decision. Like, nah, you know, you, you, you sort of said, put your best deals on the table and you decide to take this one. I'm not going to respect that decision all that much because you're now going back on your word pretty significantly. And everybody sort of saw all the stuff above board. So I, I think there'll probably be less flips. And I think what's going to end up happening is a lot of the collectives are going to have these deals that are on the table and probably even somewhat public in some respects to, to sort of, you know, push guys into making a decision. That's a good transition into four big bits here. Will. let's talk about the Gator guard uh, this week, Darren Heitner, an attorney who has, he's been very influential with a lot of the NIL legislation here in Florida. He announced the creation of a group called the Gator guard, the Gator guard, is essentially if the Gator Collective, the way I'm breaking it down, Will, is that if the Gator Collective are the people who buy tickets to go to the game, the Gator Guard are essentially those bull Gators sitting up in the boxes, right? They, these these are the big mega donors. Hugh Hathcock, who announced a, a large gift to the school this week, he began the 
the fund here with an initial three million dollar investment. This these are targeting big money folks. Uh, and the Gator Collective is more. I think the Gator Collective feels like a more hands on organic organization and the gator guard that separation here big money folks that there's it's going to be a, a smaller club but definitely an impact on the nil yeah i mean so the two entities are working together right i mean they did announce that they're going to be working together there might be some legal reason to keep them separate there might be some <laughs> there might be some reason for the big money donors to keep it separate i don't really know the details i think what it really indicates is florida now has a war chest now how big that war chest is in comparison to everybody else is something that that we're going to find out as things go along but basically if you think about it, i think i think they announced the other day at the gator collective that they've given out like $900,000 in nil deals already um, and that there and the Gator Guards uh, principle or one of the differentiators they're putting out there is that they will already have the funds to fund the NIL deal when they put that on the table, right? So you don't have to worry that, you know, somebody commits, you know, somebody has an NIL deal for 8 million bucks somewhere. No, oh, they got $25 in the piggy bank <laughs> as collateral and that's all they got. And is the money actually going to come through? Are the fans going to come through? And are you going to end up scrapped three years down the road because the collective can only pay that one person because they haven't built up this money? In this way, the Florida program in association with the collectives will be able to figure out how to allocate resources in a way in which you're able to hopefully maximize the level of talent that you bring into the program and Look, I mean, $5 million isn't anything to sniff at. Um, you know, the fact that Hathcock gave, uh, I think it was a $12 million gift to the basketball program uh, means that, you know, if, if they need an extra an extra infusion, they might be able to go back to them. I just love it because, you know, my little boy's name's Hugh. So, you know, now there's another Hugh out there who's uh, who's making a difference for Gator Nation. Hopefully, eventually, my boy goes there too. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, your Hugh had the Game Changer shirt, right? You put out on Twitter. Game changer coordinator. No, that's a, that's Oliver. Oliver's the little guy. Oh, that was Oliver. I'm sorry. Yeah, he yeah. he's the he's the Chinese looking one who plays baseball. He's 10. So he uh he looks much more like his mother, which is good for him. He doesn't look like me, but uh <laughs> no, nah, he he's uh he's he's our first. So I named him after my grandfather, which is cool. So um, I mean Hathcock seems like an interesting character. Spent a semester at Florida. Um, then went off and started his own business, become very, very successful, but obviously uh, very influential within the Florida program. And there are a lot of people there. That, that's the thing I think that, so NIL is going to be used in a few different ways. Um, I think for some programs that get it right, um, you know, you think about like the Virginia Techs of the world, if they can do it right, they can build a program that's built off guys who maybe don't get very large NIL deals and then go after a quarterback. Right. So you find so you think about Virginia Tech in 1999, they had a defense that was built essentially on three star prospects out of Virginia Beach, um, the Richmond area as well. That's sort of where they recruited those guys, bring those in a strong running game, strong defense, build that team into a team that goes basically you know, nine and two, nine and three every year. And then they bring in Michael Vick. And all of a sudden the program is is national championship worthy with Vick at quarterback. Tyrod Taylor a couple of years later and the program is almost there. They almost got there, but Taylor wasn't quite good enough to get them there um, on a consistent basis. Those sorts of programs I think might benefit because they could get a large enough, um, a large enough contract for somebody like a Michael Vick or somebody like that to get them to go to a place like that. I think about Syracuse with Donovan McNabb, if, you know, decades ago now uh, that that'd be probably a good example as well. And then you have the programs like Florida and Alabama and Tennessee and basically the SEC, everybody but Vanderbilt. And these programs should be able to really tap into their alumni network, tap into their history, tap into the conference and all that sort of stuff. And they're going to have a distinct advantage over other teams, right? Ohio State is going to have a distinct advantage over everybody else in the Big Ten, except maybe Michigan. Um, Florida should have an advantage, quite honestly, over Florida State and Miami, just because of its alumni reach and its alumni size. I actually am very curious. You mentioned it before we came on. UCF, or I'm sorry, Central Florida is Central. Uh, Central, Central is, you know, that's a big school. And the question becomes how many people – from that school are going to become wealthy and wealthy to the level that they're able to compete with Florida. We'll see, obviously they're in a big conference now, or at least until, until 
Texas and Oklahoma leave. They're in a big conference. And, uh, you know, we'll sort of see where that goes. But Florida, I think, is very well positioned because of its alumni base, because of its history, because of the conference that it's in to really take advantage of this sort of stuff. And I think the Gator Guard is the first avenue towards that. Um, I'm not a huge fan of these collectives, not necessarily, not because I mean, they're necessary within the NIL. I would rather the players be getting paid. I, I just think it's kind of ridiculous that, you know, Florida is going to get a giant check from the SEC for the TV contract. And none of that money is being used to fund the players as opposed to having to go out and beg boosters and, and collectives and that sort of stuff. But that, I mean, that's my only qualm with it. And if people want to spend their money on that sort of stuff, then great. Right. Because it, it gives Florida well, an advantage out we, there. We've seen already. I, I think the one thing the Gator collective has done just, and, and this is just, you know, looking at it from the outside here, the Gator Collective has done a great job. And I mean, we see, uh, you know, Gator Dave's in on this too, where the connection, you're seeing a lot more access to the players than you've seen in the past. And that's definitely been an influence with the Gator Collective. And I think, uh, you know, it, maybe personalizing some of these relationships with this type of access uh, is going to be beneficial for the program and beneficial for the collective itself because, it, you know, that type of access, I saw a cool message on, Twitter where they're doing birthday messages to kids, kind of like cameo type stuff. I, I, I think that type of stuff's awesome. And if it can benefit the player and it's uh, something that the fans get some feel like they're getting something in return for it, I, I think it's an interesting route to go. But I definitely see the need uh, for, you know, there's a difference between, you know, our, our, our $25 donations, Will, and, and – and the guy stroking a check for $3 million. You need those big whales in the program too. To, uh, those are the guys that make really make things go around too. Well, especially with guys getting $8 million deals out there, right? right. I mean, the, the, and the rumors for Texas A&M last year were like, you know, 25 or 30 million bucks. And, you know, you're, you're sitting there looking at that going, geez, how are you going to compete? Well, Florida now at least has an opportunity to compete. I think those those estimates for, for Texas A&M were probably a little bit ridiculous, but I think multiple millions of dollars coming in from oil tycoons going to Texas A&M, not unreasonable. I think there's a reason why Texas and Oklahoma want to be in the SEC. I think some of that is, is that, you know, you're going to have – people who recognize that you're going to have to compete with Alabama and Georgia and Florida and Auburn and all those teams. And so they're expecting that their alumni are going to support that as well. So, you know, look, I think it's a whole new ball game in college football, whether it's good or bad. You know, I think they're just, just like when they expand the playoff, I hate it, but I'm still going to watch. I'm still going to care. I'm still going to pay attention and I'm still going to have my, my opinions on it. And sort of the same thing here, right? I mean, it's changing. Florida is taking advantage of it. I think Florida, if nothing else, Napier is fully engaged in terms of making sure that this stuff works, right? The fact that the collective is an official sponsor of UF, so it can be advertised during games. The fact that you've got this Gator Guard being put together, the fact that Napier is talking about this as being at least a tool in the toolbox when he's recruiting means that it's going to be used. The question is, is it used properly? And look, I, I, this is going to be just like we, at the end of a game, we analyze whether a coach used his timeouts right and whether he made the right play call on third and two. And, you know, why do he go for that fourth down? Why do he send that kicker out? That guy sucks. Like, you know, we, we go through that all the time when it talks, when we talk about the game, this is just going to be one more thing, right? I mean, there is an entire business that has been built up in sports, especially like if you look at major league baseball, there is an entire business that's built around valuation of players and you know they're, they're it used to be the rays were great at this they would sign a guy coming up right when he came up from the minor leagues they'd give him like 20 million bucks uh, you know it'd be like a t be like a six or seven year contract for 20 million dollars Evan Longoria. They did, yeah they did this with Longoria right and then he comes up and all of a sudden it's 40 home runs and you're like oh we would have had to pay you know, $30 million a year to get that guy, but we got him for six years for 30 million bucks or whatever it ends up being. Um, and, and that, I think that finding the efficiencies, finding the way to sort of utilize the funds in a way that, that enhances your program is going to be a big part of college football and a big part of the things that we get to analyze over the next few years. Yeah. And it's, it's like, we talk about, you know, I, I mentioned the guys potentially, holding out as long as possible to commit. Potentially you mentioned the opposite, sign the contract and the money's yours right up front type deal. Maybe it's more incentivized. So there's so much that can happen with this NIL stuff. 
it's just going to be fascinating to watch how college football evolves. And, and for people who are out there who are just decrying it as a bad thing right away, ultimately the players are getting paid. They have more agency. I think this is going to be an interesting change in the sport. It's going to be an evolution to the sport, but let's not pretend like we haven't been on this path for, you know, you go, going back into the 1980s, like when you're fighting battles to get on TV, the money started coming out. And, uh, you know, this isn't Woody Hayes making $35,000 a year anymore, folks. You got no. college head coaches making $10 million here. It's a different it's a different day and age. Why shouldn't the players be able to partake? And I, I think the direction Florida's heading, they're being proactive. They're, it's, not, it's not waiting until – I guess what's exciting, the other part that I'm excited about with this announcement, with the Gator Guard in particular here this past week, the facilities thing, you look at it, we were slow on that equation. And we kind of had the attitude for years. You hear it from a lot of people around the program that, hey, this is Florida. We don't need to play those games. You know, Oregon needs to do that because they're in the Northwest. No one wants to go there. Everyone wants to come to Florida. We were slow to evolve in that area. And we're finally getting that. We're finally catching up. We're finally catching up. We're on the front end with this stuff. I I think we're out there. You you can argue, like you said, it's going to be another aspect to evaluate about the program, but it feels like we're on the earlier side uh, of the NIL stuff than, than we were on other aspects of program development off the field. No, I mean, I think that's a good point. So, you know, look, I I think um, obviously the first NIL battle looks like we lost. So we'll, so we'll see how it moves forward as things go on. And, and, you know, look, it's going to be fascinating. I don't think anybody knows where this is going to land. I think um, I have no problem with the players getting the money. I think one of the things I'm hopeful for is that we've seen a lot because this is sort of the first year, just in terms of player retention. I'm sure there have been a lot of NIL deals. It's not a coincidence that we've seen a lot of deals announced for Gator players who are already here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm sure that has to do with retention. And I'm sure different programs are going to have guys transfer because they can't get an NIL deal where they currently are. And, you know, they previously committed there. And then if they transfer, they might get an opportunity for one. Um, what hopefully will happen is things will settle down a little bit in many ways because, you know, that Tennessee deal that we talked about, you know, what, a month ago or so. Um, alleged, sorry, allegedly alleged, Tennessee. Yes. The alleged Tennessee deal. Important distinction. That, that was in the athletic. <laughs> So that was not eight million bucks. Like it wasn't an eight million dollar signing bonus, right? Right. It was eight million dollars with incentives and significant incentives over, to have someone over stay three through years their, to have yeah. someone stay through their junior year, right? Yeah. And so you're going to see situations with these big time guys where they come in and because of NIL they don't transfer out. So right now it seems like the wild wild west with people transferring all over the place. But that's because there were no deals in place, right? And now that the deals are starting to get put in place, those deals are going to have things built in, I'm sure, that enable the coach to lock in multiple years with particular players. That'll actually be fascinating to me. Well, one of the things that'll be fascinating is, you know, if you're a, say, top 10 recruit, you can probably maximize your revenue or you can maximize your agency. I don't think you're going to be able to do both. Right. So, you know, you think about the way LeBron did it in the NF or in the NBA, where he would sign not necessarily year to year contracts, but he'd sign short contracts, two year contracts, three year contracts, knowing that he could lean on the organization and try to make them make moves to be good right away because he always had that threat of leaving, whether it was Cleveland or Miami or Cleveland again, and now even Los Angeles, um, that threat always existed that he might, that he might leave. And so these top 10 guys might be able to sort of put their thumb on the organization, especially for programs that have struggled in the past. Whereas a school like Florida, hopefully is able to structure deals to make that person be, um, you know, to make, to make that recruit be there for multiple years without having to play games every year to make sure you retain them. Yeah, I mean, I I would much rather see a senior who's contributed to the program, who's a solid player, you know, or like a, a junior like Gervon Dexter is a good example, right? Probably if he has a good year, he's going to be headed off to the NFL draft, no doubt, with his size and everything. He'll be he'll if he has one good season, you're talking about potentially even first round with him. So a guy like that though is year three of the program. I'd rather see him at the top of the payroll if you're going to break it down that way than some freshman that's coming in. So I, I think different schools will have different approaches to it. You might see a school like Virginia Tech you use as an example. Hey, we're not going to pay incoming freshmen this, but if you turn into Michael Vick, this is what you get. And and I think you'll see different approaches from different schools. And a school like Tennessee that that 
is desperate to get back into things here at a top level. They're going to throw the bag at a guy and take that chance on the freshman. So it's just, it's another piece of the program to evaluate. It'll, it'll be super interesting to see how it plays out. I'm looking forward to it. Well, well, and remember that the schools aren't actually allocating the funds, right? It's being, it's being allocated by, a, third, by right. a collective or a third party right. doing it in exchange for name, image, and likeness rights. So that adds another fascinating wrinkle, which is that it's not actually a contract with the school, which means there's probably other lawyerly things that'll go on to get people extracted from these sorts of big deals and all sorts of other stuff as this moves on. So as always, the lawyers are going to make a lot of money and, and I just hope the kids end up making, making the lion's share and not, not the other way around, but you know, we'll see how it works out. Gator Guard, Gator Collective. Keep an eye out and see how that evolves over time here. Let's move on to 6-Bit. Like we mentioned at the beginning of the show, the NFL draft is tomorrow. Not Gator heavy this year, but there are four guys that have a good shot of being drafted, maybe even in the first round here with Kyrie uh, Elam Will. I know he was the guy that you thought by the end of the season, he was playing through some injuries, didn't put his best tape out in, in his junior year here. You thought there was a chance he might even be coming back. But earlier in the offseason, like before the season started, those early 2023 mock drafts, this guy was a top 10 pick. Might slide to the late first round, early second round. The good part about sliding, though, you got a shot at ending up with a team that uh, is fairly successful instead of, instead of having to come to Jacksonville. So that's that's a good part about sliding to the bottom yeah. of the first round. Unless he ends up the first pick in the second round, at which oh, point, uh, you know, tough all luck. of a sudden now you're in Jacksonville, though. <laughs> though I suspect Jacksonville's had enough issues with Florida Gator cornerbacks. That's probably not going to be the direction that they go again. Yeah. Um, look, I, I think one of the reasons I thought Elam might come back is because of the NIL, right? I mean, we talked about that. We knew it was, we knew it was going on. If you can make a little bit of money and make more money by moving up in the first round, um, then it makes some sense at the same time. You know, I think people will look at his tape from two years ago, look at his tape from last year, understand he was injured and say, Hey, what can we project this guy to be? The other thing is, is once you get injured, you realize how short this can be. Right. I mean, granted it wasn't a debilitating injury, but it is an injury and that injury does have an impact on somebody's earning potential. And you go, Hey, that could be, could be worse next time. So you start combining all those things. And yeah. It makes a little bit sense to go and look, I'm not going to, I mean, I'm going to root for him. I hope he does great. I think you spent three years in Gainesville you did what you could to help the Gators win. And at the end of the day, you're going to go make some money and represent the school. So um, happy for Kyrie Elam. I hope he goes higher than they've got him projected. Um, you know, but yeah, I think somewhere in that 25 to 30 range seems to be where people agree that he's probably going to go. I think someone's going to get a really good cornerback. Yeah. It seems like a guy that's just steady, steady player that'll be in the league for has a great shot at having one of those 10 year vet type of uh, corners. Uh, another guy projected Mid round here, we're talking maybe third through fifth round here. Zachary Carter, Zachary Carter. I I think what he lacks in maybe that elite explosiveness off the edge. You're going to get a strong player that can play inside and outside. I think he's a versatile defender. I think he could do a lot uh, of different things. So I I think that this is a guy too that he was a he was a consistent player. Throughout his career, dealt with a inj- little bit of injury bug here or there, but nothing, nothing too serious. And I, I think he will be a solid, solid pickup in the mid rounds for whoever grabs him. Yeah, I think the, the interesting thing about Carter is, God, have you ever seen any of his recruiting pictures? He looks, he looks like a linebacker, maybe even a safety. Mm-hmm. And it, he is, he does not look like that now. I mean, he he looks like a real. I mean, even la- it's not like he's a. Brenton Cox outside linebacker rush in. No, he's a real defensive end. And so, you know, you start thinking about teams like the Patriots that run three fours and really just about every organization in the NFL at this point runs a three, four, or at least some variation of a, a, you know, a three, three, five, something like that. Um, So he's going to have a fit. And I think one of the things he did really well um, is, is set the edge against the run, which you can't necessarily say about the other side of the defensive line. And certainly the other thing that he did a couple of years ago, specifically when Kyrie Campbell was out, they were able to slide him inside. And he was still able to get pressure up the middle. So I, I think one of the things that NFL teams are going to see is that versatility and a guy who's big enough that he can hold up on the inside of the defensive line. You think about the Giants when they were taken on the Patriots in those Super Bowls with the four defensive linemen who were able to give Tom Brady fits. Um, you know, that's 
a valuable commodity to have a guy who can be an outside rusher, but also then can move inside and make room for a more explosive outside rusher on third down when you know the defense or when you know the offense isn't going to run the ball. So that's a place where I think Carter will probably be able to find a fit. I don't know that he's necessarily a four to, or a three down, three down defensive lineman, at least not yet. But you look at his progression, like I said, from the picture he was when he came in the door to where he is now, and you go, okay, well, if this guy continues to progress, um, what are we going to see? And certainly he is a story of coming back to school and making yourself some money because he's probably, I would guess, an undrafted free agent last year comes back and now he's going to be, you know, maybe a third, third round pick. So going from being undrafted free agent, making the minimum to making a couple of million bucks guaranteed, I think, uh, you know, wise decision to come back to school. Yeah. Won't be, won't be a superstar guy, but definitely a good team guy and a solid contributor in the league, which is what you look for in the middle of the draft there. Uh, another guy going in the middle of the draft that I think third rounds may be high for him, but you're seeing kind of fourth or six is Damian Pierce Pierce. Might be a sleeper here. Might be a sleeper in this mid-round pick. If he goes to the right team, gets an opportunity early in his career, just a strong running back. I, I mean, the, the, the run against Florida State, that's an all-time classic without the helmet, finishing without the helmet. That tells you everything you need to know about the guy's attitude on game day. Um, was a player that a lot of Gator fans feel like didn't get the ball enough. The good news for Damian Pierce on that front is that means he didn't have – he comes into the draft here – with not a lot of mileage on him. So you're looking at a guy who maybe averaged seven carries per game, even though there's a lot of critique around Dan Mullen uh, about that topic last year. That's the trend in the NFL. Outside of Derrick Henry and some elite running backs, you see a lot of teams working a lot of different backs throughout the year. I mean, good luck. I, I don't know why anyone drafts New England running backs in fantasy football. I, I know a couple of them have a good game here or there, but you're going to get maybe like three ga good games max from a New England running back in fantasy football because they rotate those guys through. So I think Pierce could be a nice asset. I would love to see him end up with a team that's got a shot where they just need that one extra piece in the rotational uh, in the rotation for the backfield. I would love to see him in, in you know, some somewhere like a Green Bay or something like that. Yeah, I mean, so look, I, I think Pierce is going to um, – I think there's a bunch of things teams are going to look at. Certainly the the lack of wear and tear, even though he spent – multiple, you know, even though he was here for four years, I think the toughness that he ran with on the inside – I think, uh, you know, even even the last couple of years, he really showed an ability to catch, I think, more than we thought he could um, to start with. And he, he did have a little bit of explosiveness. I mean, if you remember his freshman year, he busted off a big run against Tennessee, a couple other big runs with, in limited carries. So does have a little bit of explosiveness, though not necessarily like explosive top end speed. I think the big thing that people are going to look at is just the level of gratitude that he that he exudes, like, you know, the, the attitude. He could have been a guy who complained they didn't get the ball enough. He could have been a guy who's grumbling, but he's the guy you saw yeah. out there mingling with the fans after road games, going out and saying thank you after his last game in the swamp, all that sort of stuff. And I'm not saying other guys didn't appreciate it, but Pierce was one of the more visible guys who was always out there during the alma mater and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, look, that's hokey and you don't have to do that stuff to be an excellent football player. At the same time, in in a situation where you're trying to, you know, if there's a tie between him and another running back, I think you take that into account and say, look, it's I'm not going to have to worry about my culture if I have this guy in there. He's not going to complain if he doesn't get carries. If I make him do special teams work, he'll do it. If, you know, if, um, you know, it, I'm not going to have to hear him grumbling about practice or reps or any of that stuff. Um, you know, hopefully he'll deal with that in a way that's on the up and up. And I think that makes a difference. I think Pierce really impressed me last year with the way he handled things, particularly when you looked at the way some other people handled things um, as, as things sort of went south. I think Pierce really, really, really showed well from the standpoint of just, you know, a culture and a character thing. Yeah, he certainly was not one of the issues last year. Uh, I, I could throw a couple names in here, potentially draftable, but let's move on to a dollar here where we'll talk about the undrafted, uh, potential undrafted players that could have an impact. Will, I've seen in multiple mock drafts here, I've seen your boy Gene DeLance get drafted late in the sixth round. People like his frame. Uh, he had good reviews after his pro day workouts this past off season here. So could someone take a late round flyer on the guy give us give him a shot potentially um the other guy that i've seen in some mock drafts here is jeremiah moon 
I mean, we saw that him work out in Indy will, and we both were like, man, that guy, <laughs> that dude looks great in a workout there. That no issue. That guy definitely looks like a football player. And when we we've seen him stay healthy, he definitely plays well. He's an interesting guy for the NFL though, because he's a little bit in between what you want. You, you think maybe a team would, would draft him with a very specific purpose in mind. So he might be, a role player early on in his career. But if he were to get drafted, they would probably have him pegged for something very, you know, maybe they have an interdivisional matchup with someone that they feel like we'll put Moon on that guy when we play. But I, I think Moon is definitely draftable. The Lance, I could see the later on flyer. That's about it in terms of guys I see getting drafted from this roster this past season. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. I, I think one of the problems I have with both of those, I mean, you said it, I was a defender of DeLance, but that was more of a matter of there's nobody better to put out there than it is. I'm really impressed with the way he's doing things. And he was good last year until, or he was much, much better last year till, till he got dinged up there about halfway through the season. Uh, but look, you look at the on-field production of a guy like DeLance, you look at the on-field production of a guy like Moon, and yeah, they might have a great frame and they might have great athleticism, but the on-field production is not there. Um, if I were a team and there was a guy I was going to think about drafting, um, and I don't think he'll get drafted, and I think it'll end up being an, uh, you know, an undrafted free agent, I, it's Malik Davis. I think Malik Davis is a guy I look at for two reasons. One, same thing, not a lot of, not a lot of wear on the tires, um, just like we talked about with, with Damian Pierce. Certainly more injuries than Damian Pierce, but before the injury, he averaged 6.7 yards per rush and was Florida's best player back in that 2017 season he gets injured he was less effective but he just averaged 5.3 yards per rush which was a 0.6 yard per rush improvement over 2020 he appears to be getting a getting back to to full health but he also only caught just 16 passes his first his first three seasons and then the last two seasons he's caught 54 passes and i'll tell you a running back who could pass protect and who can catch the ball out of the backfield is going to be valuable in an yep. nfl system i mean just think about think about white for new england you mentioned new england's running backs he's the only one who's worth <laughs> worth a fantasy pick right is the guy who can catch the ball out of the backfield so you think about like let's say tampa decided to take a malik davis do you think that uh, tom brady would be able to find a way to use him coming out of the oh, backfield yeah. i think yeah. he could the other thing is and I, I you think about sort of his stature the way he moves his ability to catch out of the backfield the guy he reminds me of is Le'Veon bell and so i went back and i looked at bell's stats at michigan state and other than just usage they're really close to malik davis so if you think that florida's offensive line was less than stellar He's somebody who I think is uh, people are going to get a, a great deal if they bring in Malik Davis. And you look at his pro day, he really showed out on his pro day. He had people in Gainesville sort of like, ooh, like we didn't realize he was that athletic. It, I think that's part of him coming back from an injury. It would not surprise me to see Malik Davis have a killer preseason somewhere. It would not surprise me at all. Um, the other names out here, Will, Stuart Reese, a couple years starter here under Dan Mullen, the transfer from Mississippi State, Antonio Valentino, Daquan Newkirk, the two defensive tackles who transferred in last year. Uh, you know, those guys, I, I, I think they'll get their shot somewhere i think they'll i think that they'll at least get a shot in camp i definitely don't see any one of those three names being drafted though no nah, i mean those those are practice squad guys right i mean maybe those guys make a roster if they show out when they get invited in but i mean again i go back to the film but one of the reasons that those guys were rated the way they were coming out of high school is athletic ability so you think about a guy like delance he was a four-star guy mm -hmm. has the build and the um at least the the measurables to be a tackle you look on the film and go okay can he do it or not that's different but the measurables are there you look at a guy like reese the measurables are relatively limited played well at mississippi state under mullen but then transfers to florida and, and it was sort of hit and miss so I, I think that one's probably a tough sell and you know look I, I think these guys will get an opportunity but i think this is also indicative you know you, the guys we're talking about you, you look at the mullen era at florida there were 25 guys drafting the nfl so you know you got the 2018 you got duke dawson callaway johnny towns and marcel harris 19 you got Jawan taylor jakai polite chauncey gardner johnson voshan joseph and jordan scarlett that's mullen's first year then you got cj henderson van jefferson jabari zaniga john grenard p ryan swain and cleveland in 2020 then you got Pitts, Tony, Trask, Marco Wilson, Evan McPherson, Sean Davis, to Daryl Slayton, and Stone Forsyth drafted last year. That's a lot of talent for a team that didn't win a whole lot of games. I mean, they they won 
Um, you know, they won like 20, 22 games over that four year period, but, um, you know, to have 25 guys drafted, we're sort of reaping what we sowed in terms of the, the recruiting over the last few years where you're going to have these fits and starts. And so I think that's sort of what we're seeing is, you know, one of the reasons Florida struggled this past year is there was not a ton of NFL talent on the well, field. Keep, keep in mind, you got that. Ventro Miller who would likely be drafted was projected in a lot of mocks last year. If he would have left uh, Ventro Miller is coming back as a super senior Trey Dean. Hey, I get frustrated as anybody watching Trey Dean blow a tackle sometimes, but I mean, he's productive. He's been a productive player in the backfield. I think he'll get a shot somewhere in the NFL. Uh, definitely could, could have been a late round pick. So some of these guys returning to school, it's throwing off the numbers a little bit, but there hasn't been a smaller, if, if, Four Gators get drafted. There hasn't been a class that small since 2014. And I believe in 2012, there are only two that were drafted. So it, it that would definitely be uh, among the lowest draft totals. Normally you're seeing numbers more like in the six to eight range with guys being drafted. But uh, so e either way, you're looking at a potentially very small class here for this past season. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I mean, obviously last year was a rough year. When you have a rough year, you're going to have a pullback in terms of the number of guys who were drafted. And with all the transition, um, I think there are guys, there are some guys who've decided to transfer elsewhere. The COVID year makes things goofy too, right? You get that COVID year. There's a lot of people who have an extra year and maybe aren't even spending it, aren't going to spend it in games. They're going to spend it someplace else. Right. So yeah, guys like true. Tyron Hopper and Diabate and, and, uh, you know, Bogle and those guys who've all gone someplace else might have in the past um, either stayed and would have been gone next year or might have even tested the waters in the draft and aren't doing that this year because they have that, ex that extra year of eligibility. So, mm -hmm. look, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing is, is good luck to all those guys on Thursday. Th these guys have these guys have worked their butts off. In order to get to this point, they've sacrificed some of them. You know, you think about Davis, I mentioned his injuries, you know, the, you tear an ACL. I mean, I just dealt with it this week. Actually, I sprained my knee that I, uh, you know, that I had surgically repaired eight years ago and I'm hobbling around and sitting there going, ah, oh, it's an old catching injury. These guys are going to have that sort of stuff, you know, down the road, they've made the sacrifice to get to this point. So this is the payoff, right? I mean, when Kyrie Elam gets drafted the first round, his family changes um, because of that sort of money, right? When Zachary Carter gets, gets drafted, he's going to sign a signing bonus. It's going to be more money than he's probably ever seen in his life. And I hope that they've been prepared by being at Florida and that Florida's put things in place to help those guys be able to manage the funds because they are still relatively young. And if you'd have given me a millions of dollars when I was, you know, 21, 22 years old, that probably wouldn't have turned out all that well. Um, but, you know, hey, congratulations, because this is what these guys have been working on for their entire lives. Um, I know they give a lot to the university and, and we appreciate that and we enjoy and love seeing them play. But one of the things that really really gives me um, gives me joy afterwards is seeing these guys um, you know make their dreams come true and that Florida's a part of that so that's that to me is what Thursday and Friday and Saturday are about is that you know this was the University of Florida helping to make these guys dreams come true and obviously they gave a lot to the, the University of Florida as well so we're thankful for that but it'll, it'll be cool right I mean there's a reason why mom and dad are always there hugging these guys when they get drafted and, you know, then they get the weird awkward hug from Goodell when they go up there and get to hold up the Jersey with the one on it, if they're a first round draft pick. And it's just a cool moment for everybody. So I hope that, I hope they enjoy it and best of luck to them. Yeah. Rooting for each and every one of them, especially uh, in the NIL era here, will go, go get that second contract and become a member of the Gator guard. It's, it's a big circle now. It's a big circle. So more second contracts in the NFL. More positive news for the Gators in the NIL era. <laughs> well, we'll have, we'll have to get Mr. Hathcock involved in uh, <laughs> in having those conversations with Chauncey Gardner Johnson about what he needs to exactly about, about contributing to the guard. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, good luck to the Gators. All the Gators in the in the draft here this weekend. Hope each and every one of them gets drafted. Best of luck going forward. Well, that's all we got for tonight. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode of Stand Up and Holler. In the meantime, enjoy the weekend, everybody, and go Gators. Go Gators. Thank you for watching this episode of Stand Up and Holler. Be sure to subscribe to the Read and Reaction YouTube channel. Join our Patreon community at Read and Reaction for bonus content each week. And check out our website at readandreaction.com. I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles, and as always, go Gators.